meet more people. Okay, yeah, so let's get started. Um, so this class, we're going to finish up the remaining parts for the introduction um, because uh, we still left the air quality index in the end. And also we'll uh, introduce a little bit about the particular matter or the PM, okay? Um, so let's do a quick recap of our last class. Uh, so basically last class, we talked about the ideal gas law. We went through some, I would say, painful derivations of these uh, different equations, right? And um, we had a few example problems. So basically what we're trying to do is to convert different parameters, right? So they include absolute concentration, right? Uh, mole fractions and mass, uh, mass concentrations. So absolute concentrations are just, let's say, Na divided by V, right? So it's uh, either moles or numbers of molecules per meter cube or per, li per liter, right? So mole fractions are Na divided by N. It doesn't have any unit, right? And mass concentrations are Ma divided by V. So by using the ideal gas law or the partial ideal gas law, we should be able to convert from one another. So I have to say that this is an important section of our class overall. Uh, maybe it's a little bit too early to say, but uh, this is going to be in both of your exams, the, the middle and midterm exam and the final exam. So try to be familiar, uh, get familiarized with this derivation. And um, uh, we'll, we'll also use this concept in the project, the team project. Um, uh, although I think for the first half of the semester, especially when we talk about the particular matter, uh, we're not going to use these concepts, but I just want to introduce these concepts early so uh, you guys can practice it uh, at an early time, right? Um, so I also want to, again, uh, touch base on this problem again, because I receive a few um, feedback that the problem is probably not uh, stated very well. So again, this uh, efficiency here, if I say the complete name, it should be combustion efficiency. So it's just like when we boil water, right? Um, we, com we combust 100 joules of fuel, only, only 40 joules of the fuel, or only 40% of the uh, energy are converted to the energy of the water, right? So in that case, we know that for the power plant, um, this energy is the electricity, right? So when we finally calculate what is coming from the combustion, we have to use this number and divide that by this combustion efficiency. So I hope uh, in this way, you guys are more clear with this concept, right? So I think you also have a few practice problems uh, for this uh, similar problems in your homework, all right? Um, so this class, we're going to learn a new concept, which is the uh, air quality index. Uh, so as, as you remember, uh, EPA or the NAAQS have a, a table of different um, concentration of the um, air pollutants, right? So basically different, uh, for different uh, criteria air pollutants, they have a table here. And then it regulates uh, which concentration tells you the air quality is good or bad, right? So typically when we measure the concentration of these criteria air pollutants, it just gives you so many different values. And there's no way we can um, basically refer to them, to them one by one to find whether the air is good or not. So that's why EPA invented this air quality index to report the air quality as uh, like an overall score. So for this um, uh, air quality index, it's it typically in the range of zero to 500. So um, you can think of this as the concentration of the gas pollutants, except that it doesn't have any unit. So for these gas pollutants, we know that the higher the value, the more polluted the air, right? So that's why the higher the value of the AQI, the worse the air quality. For example, if the AQI is very low, zero to 50, then that's good, right? If it's above 300, then that's hazardous. And so generally the EPA will also give you suggestions for different groups of people. For example, for older people or young children, uh, when they're um, more sensitive to the air pollutants. They will also give suggestions that people should stay indoors, right? And when it's green, then it will recommend people to exercise outside. So basically the AQI is a value uh, that um, 
shows uh, how is the air quality in, in the overall range, all right? So how do we calculate the AQI? Um, so again, we have to refer to a table. So in this table, the EPA give you uh, the, basically the concentration range of different gas pollutants, right? So uh, you have PM, right? PM 2.5, PM, PM 10. You have nitrogen dioxide, ozone, CO, uh, sulfur dioxide, and lead. So these are the criteria air pollutants. So the EPA also add another gas pollutant, which is ammonia. So this is also a quite important one. So that's why they also listed the concentration here. So uh, the way we decide the AQI is first on the left-hand side, you see there are different AQI ranges, zero to 50, again, it's good, right? 50, 51 to 100, that's yellow, right? that's sat satisfactory, right? So here is the category of the AQI. So it's decided by the value of the, or the concentration of the gas pollutants. So let's say we have an ozone concentration of 150, okay? If it has a concentration of 150 microgram per meter cube, then we know that the AQI in terms of the ozone is gonna be moderate, right? Similarly, if the sulfur dioxide have a concentration of let's say 400 microgram per meter cube, then we know that the air quality AQI in terms of the sulfur dioxide is poor. But we also mentioned that um, the EPA measures all different types of criteria air pollutants. So we cannot just say that the AQI is um, moderate for certain gas species or uh, unhealthy for another certain gas species. So the way we determine the overall AQI uh, have to go through the following process. So let's say we have an EPA station and monitors the air quality, right? It gives you the concentration of the carbon monoxide of five milligram per meter cube, PM10 of 300 microgram per meter cube, and also sulfur dioxide is 50 micro, uh, microgram per meter cube. So the way we determine the AQI is first, we will look at what category the air quality is based on each type of the gas pollutants. So for example, for carbon monoxide, we see that five milligram will fall into this region, right? It's 2.1 to 10, right? So we know that AQI is in the moderate region. And in terms of the PM10, that's 300 uh, microgram per meter cube, that falls, in within, falls within this region, which is a poor air quality. Well, for the sulfur dioxide, it falls within this region, right? It's satisfactory. So the final, AQ, uh, so the second step is that the final AQI is the highest AQI. So basically the air quality is determined by the most highly concentrated pollutant. So in this case, we know that the AQI have to be calculated based on the PM10, right? Because PM10 has the highest concentration, it determines the air quality index, right? So finally, when we calculate the AQI, we'll just use the linear interpolation for this PM10. So what happens is, Let's say we plot the x-axis as PM10 concentration, right? Y-axis is the AQI, right? So um, what happens is <clears throat> on the x-axis, concentration is 251 to 350. Y-axis is 201 to 300. So we'll just assume it's a linear relationship. And then we will calculate what is the AQI in terms of the uh, PM10 concentration. Here we have 300. We know that it, it's in the middle, right? So we can use this, this equation. So um, basically that's gonna be 201 plus um, the proportion of this lens over the entire proportion right, and then multiply by the gap between these two AQI values. So if you plug in these values, you can find out that the final AQI is 250. So this is how we determine the AQI when we measure all different types of air pollutants, right? Um, so any questions regarding this step, right? So uh, basically this is the equation when you know, when you do the linear interpolation. So if you have questions on this equation, <clears throat> you can probably look into other materials. Uh, that's gonna be in your mathematics uh, in earlier semesters, okay? Uh, so this is how we determine the AQI. And we know that um, 
actually United States have a lot of EPA stations. So this is what they're reporting in terms of the AQI. And this is also showing the map of the entire North America. You see, uh, Canada also have these air quality and they have their own, own EPA. They will report the air quality index, right? We have in the United States, we have just, just so many of these stations. It can give you a pretty high resolution map in terms of the uh, in terms of the air quality index. And we also have a few in, the, uh, in uh, Mexico, right? So overall, if we look at the air quality in the United States, we can find out that um, normally the West Coast air quality is not very good. So this is mainly because the dominant wind direction in this latitude where the United States is located at is going to be west wind. So the air pollutants are going to be blown inwards. But we know that there are mountains here, right? So it's basically going to trap all of these air pollutants in here. It's not good for the transport of the air pollutants. So on the East Coast, although we know that there are a lot of um, industries or power plants here, all the pollutants can get effectively transported to the ocean. So we're not going to trap all of these air pollutants. So that's why in our first class, I introduced that if we want to build a coal-fired power plant in the United States, we want to build it at the East Coast, Right? It's mainly because the dominant wind direction is going to be, um, it's going to help the transport of all of these uh, gas pollutants. So um, now we have a question. So is this density enough? So let's say if I go to this interactive map here, say QICN. <clears throat> so if you're interested, you can also. Um, log through this website and then take a look. Okay. So you see, this is the um, real time interactive uh, interface of this website. Okay. You just have so many of these stations. But if we further zoom in, let's say, let's look at the state of Missouri. All right. So we mentioned that all of these um, um, AQI values are reported by EPA stations. But in terms of the EPA station, they have to be well regulated, right? They have to use certified instruments, um, accurate instruments, and those will cost a lot of money, right? So that's why in the state of Missouri, we don't have a lot of these EPA stations. It's probably maximum 20 stations. There are a lot near Kansas City, quite a lot near St. Louis, right? Uh, there's one in Springfield, but if we look at Rolla, we don't have any, right? So although overall, in terms of the United States, it looks quite dense, but um, when we look at uh, a lot, when we zoom in, basically, the, the resolution is still not good enough, right? So if you're interested, you can also click, let's say one station. You see, they actually measure PM 2.5, PM 10. So for some stations, they also measure ozone. Right here, station measures ozone here. Also give you the uh, real time, right? Provide you hourly concentration of these gas pollutants. So you can find out that uh, basically it's provided by the Missouri Department of Natural Resources. Right? So these are certified stations that provide you the AQI values. But in terms of the overall resolution, it's still not good enough. So that's why um, right now in the um, air quality management, People are trying to utilize um, low cost air quality sensors because for a lot of these um, EPA monitoring stations, it might cost around a million dollars to purchase all the instruments to, uh, to maintain them, right? But if we try to use these low cost air quality sensors, each of them will just cost 20 or $30. So we can just deploy it outside our building, building right? So they can generate um, pretty good data compared to these certified instruments. So we can uh, enhance the resolution uh, of the air quality over a certain area. So uh, in my group, I also um, deploy and develop a few air quality sensors. So if you're interested, you can also let me know. I can show you a few uh, air quality sensors, right? Um, so let's get back to the contents. So this is about the AQI. Uh, so this will actually be the final part for the uh, introduction section. So now we'll 
um, go through the criteria air pollutant one by one. So we'll talk about their mechanism of formation, right? Ways to remove them because this class is about air pollution control. So we'll also introduce the control methodologies for each of the criteria air pollutants. So the first one we'll talk about is the PM. So we introduced that PM is basically particulate matter. All right, it's equal to PM. So um, I also introduced that um, it has a more, uh, let's say a more regulated or more scientific name. So people also call them as aerosols. Okay, so in this class, um, I'll just use these terms uh, quite often. So when I talk about aerosols, you can also regard, it them, regard them as PM or particular matter, right? Um, so, um, so what is this definition? So if you look at more scientific definition of the PM or particular matter, it's just composed of uh, a few words. It's actually a, called a stable cluster of molecules. Okay, so PM is not a molecule. Right, PM is not a molecule. Let's say when we talk about um, gas species, oxygen, nitrogen, or argon, gas or gas molecules, they're not particles, they're not PM. So only when they are a stable cluster, because we know that a lot of gas molecules, let's say oxygen and nitrogen, they also collide with each other, right? So once they touch each other, uh, it's also a cluster of molecules, but they're not stable. So they also disassemble, right? So whenever they are stable, it's a cluster of molecules, we'll call them as PM or aerosols. So in this regard, let's do a, a, a pool question. So is our Earth a particle based on this definition? Okay, I have five seconds. Okay, let's stop here. All right, so our Earth is not going to disassemble anytime, right? So in terms of the definition, then it's gonna be stable, right? It's a stable cluster of molecules. And it's indeed a particle because when we learn about physics, when we look at the entire solar system, the Earth is just a stable particle surrounding the uh, that transport uh, that moves around the Earth, uh, moves around the Sun, right? It's, it is a particle. So also, in this regard, a potato is a particle. Right? So I'll I'll use a, a potato as an example quite a lot in this uh, class, okay? Because I like potatoes. Right? When I go to a grocery, I buy a lot of potatoes there. So they are particles, right? Later on, we'll also use potato as examples, right? So um, because of that, um, we know that quite many objects in our daily lives are particles. And actually particles can influence our lives by quite a lot. So here, I'm just showing a few uh, applications of the particles, how they're going to interact with our daily life, okay? So we're talking about PM, particular matter or aerosols, right? So they can have light scattering. In this class, we'll talk quite a lot about the light, light scattering properties, okay? Um, um, so basically the light can interact with these particles. They can uh, diffract or transport the light into all different directions. And will also affect our Earth's energy balance because once we have particles suspended in the air, it will diffract or it will interact with the solar radiation, right? So also affect the cloud formation. We see a lot of clouds on the sky, but uh, we know that the clouds are, cloud droplets are mainly composed of um, water inside, right? But the way we form clouds is always starting from an aerosol, starting from a particle. So water vapor are going to condense onto the surface of the particle to form these cloud droplets. 
right? We know that if the Earth have a lot of clouds, then a lot of solar radiation will get reflected back into the universe. So that will also affect the climate of the Earth, right? So once we have clouds, um, we're going to form rainfall, right? Also, um, from either natural sources or uh, human activities, we can generate a lot of these fires. Fire generate particular matter too. So they can, uh, there can be sources, sinks, and also evolution of these particles, right? So uh, these PM have health effects. And as a matter of fact, the reason why it's regulated as a criteria air pollutant is because of its health effect, right? It's not because of uh, it can affect the climate, right? So once we inhale them, it can deposit into different regions of our respiratory system. So they can damage our cells, right? Affect our uh, genetic systems even, right? And uh, nowadays, uh, probably you haven't noticed so, but nowadays people use a lot of these nanoparticles or aerosols or part PM to apply them into the nano engineered devices. For example, the solar cells, um, Actually, the, the one that we use a lot or the most is sunscreen. So sunscreen have a lot of these nanoparticles inside, right? We use these PM to uh, promote or enhance our lives, right? Um, and, and I think that for civil engineers, um, you guys, when, when you make the uh, concrete, you also add fly ash, right? So fly ash can be enhanced by uh, silicon nanoparticles. So there's also construction applications of these uh, PM as well. So um, here is an example. So we'll start from the light scattering uh, first because this is a quite uh, important uh, application or quite important influence of the PM. So here, uh, just put this aside. So here I'm just showing um, a few pictures of our national parks. So on the left-hand side, uh, if you have been there, you can uh, recognize that this is a Yosemite um, National Park, right? On the right-hand side, that's the Glacier National Park. So what this is showing is the, uh, the view under two different PM concentrations, right? So uh, if you notice here, it's listing the particular matter concentrations. So on the left-hand side, these are uh, two pictures or two environmental conditions for the, the Yosem Yosemite National Park. On the right-hand side, these are two another PM concentrations. So what you see is that when we have a higher concentration of the PM, we're seeing these hazy view here. It affects our visibility, right? And if you recall, what is the NAAQS or the EPA standards? If you check the table there, you find that the PM 2.5, the regulation is 35 microgram per meter cube. PM 10 is 150 microgram per meter cube. So you can see that actually this first image is very clean environment. Well, the second one may be a little bit hazardous, right? And of course, I think for the second one of the Glacier National Park, it actually still fa falls within the, um, the good air quality, right? But uh, you're already seeing these hazy environment here. Right? So why do we see this uh, re reduction of the visibility here? So uh, it is because of these suspended particles. Let's say this is how our eye works, right? We're trying to look at an apple here. And if the apple is very close to our eye, within five meters, so although even though there are uh, particles or gas molecules in between, we can still see that because it's just too close to our eye, right? But if it's far away from our eye, let's say 100 meters, uh, we can still see there's an object under clean environment, mainly because there are nothing in the background. We can see a high contrast. Although our eye may not be very sharp there, we may say, oh, maybe there's an apple or a pear or something else, but we can see the contrast. We can tell there's an object. But when there are a lot of particles in between, then the light that's emitted by the, uh, the apple, so basically the sunlight or some other um, lamp, uh, the, the radiation or the light shines upon the particle, uh, shines upon the apple, is going to reflect light, right? That's why we see the apple here. But when there are a lot of particles, the reflected light or, or scattered light are going to get stopped or basically get scattered by these particles in all directions. 
So finally, the light that can penetrate through the intensity will be very low, right? So there's going to be a low contrast. So on a hazy day, we cannot see the, the high contrast. We cannot see this, see the apple anymore. We cannot see these views anymore. So this is basically how the light scattering works. So light scattering just um, redirect the light into all different directions, right? And um, actually this is also, um, uh, this also has a lot of applications in our, um, basically a lot of common observations we make in our daily life. So I think in your uh, previous knowledge, with your previous knowledge on physics, uh, you probably know why the sky looks blue, right? So uh, there is a reason that it looks blue. It's not from the solar radiation. So let's just do a quick poll again, to see if you guys know the background information. So why is the sky blue? So I should probably introduce this question before I talk about light scattering, okay? so. I noticed I talked about light scattering first, and you guys probably would know that it's because of the light scattering. Okay, so you guys finished. All right, so it is not because of the reflection from the ocean, because if that's the case, um, in mainland, let's say in, in Rolla, we shouldn't see as blue as the region near the coast, right? The sky is always blue, no matter where you are. Right. It's mainly because of the light scattering. And as a matter of fact, it can explain a lot of different phenomena we see. Right? For example, we see um, on a clear sky, uh, clear weather, we see blue sky, white sun, right? During the sunset or sunrise, we see red sun or yellow sun. We see this cloud color of the uh, yellowish sky here. But in the universe, what we see is still the white sun, but we're not going to see this blue color, right? Many in the universe, there are no particles, no gas molecules. It's not going to scatter light. That's why we can only see this uh, uh, dark background or black background. But the sun still looks white, mainly because it contains all different wavelengths of uh, radiation. And because of the same reason, during wildfires, we can see the sun, although it's still during noontime, you can see a similar color compared to the sunset, okay? So I will just introduce this um, mechanism behind a little bit, okay? So if we look at the radiation spectrum of, this, uh, of the sun, it actually contains a lot of wavelengths, right? It contains the ultraviolet radiation, or basically the UV light. We know that this part of light is bad for a human being, it will cause skin cancer. It also contains the infrared region, the IR region, basically the microwave, right? We talked about it last class. And this is a part that radiation that um, warms up our, our Earth. So we also have this visible region, right? It contains the spectrum of light. So this is the part that um, our human eye can observe, right? So the sun has a spectrum of this light. Basically, um, the entire uh, sun will look white. So basically by combining all of these spectrum together, we're going to have a white sun there, right? So my, I think my cell phone is ringing. Just let me quickly turn it off. Okay, so let's All right, sorry about that. All right, so because we have a spectrum of radiation, um, from the sun, so basically the sun is going to look white when the sky is clean or when we observe it from the universe, right? Um, so what happens during the clear sky, the reason, the, in terms of the blue sky, what happens is, let's say uh, we're this uh, little uh, person here, right? So what happens is we're standing on the earth, right? The sun is above us, 
So what we also know is that our Earth has the atmosphere, has a thick atmosphere, right? It contains a lot of molecules, it contains a lot of particles as well. So what happens is when solar radiation penetrates through the atmosphere, so the particles here are going to scatter light in all different directions. Gas molecules, particles, they're going to scatter light in all different directions. And in general, um, the size of these uh, molecules or particles in the atmosphere are much smaller compared to the visible range, okay? So in general, these particles are a few hundreds of nanometers. They're, sh they're smaller than basically the purple light, okay? And we know that the gas molecules are much smaller than, much, much smaller. So because of that, the scattered intensity is the strongest when the size of the particle is close to the radiation wavelength. So what, what that means is it's going to scatter a lot of light in the UV region and maybe some part of the purple or blue region, okay? So because of that, it's going to scatter blue light or purple light, right? And because of the large amount of these particles in the atmosphere, so the sky is going to look blue, right? But if we directly look at the sun that's above us, the thickness of the uh, at atmosphere is actually quite thin in this direction, okay? So not, to, not a lot of light are being scattered when the radiation passes through this uh, direction here. So that's why the sun will still look white, right? Not a lot of light or not a lot of, lot of radiation are being lost through this process. So the sun is still going to look white. So this is going to give us the white sun and blue sky. Okay, does that make sense? Right? Okay. So now let's talk about the sunset. Okay, so what happens during sunset is, say, we're again standing here. When sunset happens, so basically the sun, maybe the sun should have a much larger scale. Okay. Sun, let's say it looks like this. So the radiation, uh, when we look at the sun, it's going to be at the horizon, right? So the radiation coming here, it has to penetrate through a very thick atmosphere, right? So it's not, it's not in the situation in here where the, the atmosphere, the thickness is relatively thin. It has to pass through a very thick layer of air. So when this happens, the particles or the molecules here are going to scatter light among, along the trajectory, okay? So all the blue light are basically um, lost when the solar radiation passes through this way. So finally, the light that gets into our, our eyes are just going to be the red or yellow color, okay? So basically the blue light are being lost when the radiation penetrates through this thick atmosphere, right? So similarly, you can look at here. So the, the sun, when it gets to the person, blue light are being scattered, okay? So the light directly coming from the sun will appear red, mainly because the blue portion of light are being lost. So this is because of PM that's suspended in the air that create this effect, right? And similar to this sunset or sunrise scenario, um, during the wildfires, we have a lot of PM, right? That's why, although the sun is still at noontime, it's still above us, we just have more particles, basically thicker uh, objects that's blocking the radiation. So when the sun, the radiation gets to us, all of those blue portion of light are being lost when they're being transported. So finally, when they get to our eye, they will look red. Okay, so does that make sense? All right, yeah. So. Uh, basically, this is how the PM actually affects the, these phenomena through the light uh, through the light scattering. So now we can also try to understand this phenomena. So I think um, you guys probably have observed these uh, lunar eclipse, right? So I think every year we'll have this event. Um, so whenever people see this lunar eclipse, um, they will say there's a red. Moon, right? 
So we really look at it. So basically, uh, what happens during the lunar eclipse is that the Earth's shadow is going to block the moon, right? So it, the area becomes larger and larger until at some point the moon totally turns red. So why does why does it look red? Basically, it's a similar mechanism compared to this sunset. Okay. So here I'm just drawing out a schematic about the relative location of the sun, earth, and our moon. Okay. So what happens during the eclipse is just that the, our earth blocks the radiation coming out of the sun, right? And then let's say our earth moves for a certain angle. Let's say our earth moves here. All right, so the radiation will get tangentially passed by the, the, the moon here. So again, because of the atmosphere, so our atmosphere have a lot of particulate matter, molecule inside, right? It's going to scatter the blue portion of the solar, solar radiation away. So we lost blue, purple. So the remaining light will be yellow or red. So the penetrated light shines upon the moon and we're going to get a red moon, okay? It's also because of the PM in the atmosphere, right? So we know that now, um, actually you can see that these uh, suspended particles, criteria air pollutant affect a lot of these large scale uh, phenomena in our daily life, right? Um, so this is just talking about the light scattering. So light scattering is just light being redirected into all different directions, right? Um, so another direct example is a wildfire taking place. I think right now in California, there's uh, quite a lot of severe um, wildfires. And this is a satellite image showing the California region. See, there are uh, basically wildfires generating a lot of these PM into the atmosphere. The reason why we see this brownish uh, plume here is because of light scattering, because solar radiation gets through the, gets onto the, uh, onto the earth, right? It shines upon these particles, and then the particles will redirect some radiation back into the uh, space station, right? So that's why we can see these particles in the space station. So if these particles exist in the air, what that basically means is the solar radiation, some proportion of it are getting reflected back into the universe, right? What that means is the solar radiation, um, which warm up the earth, are not going to uh, get absorbed by the Earth. So they're redirected or reflected back into the universe. So this will cause a net cooling effect in terms of our, our climate, right? So this is called the direct effect. So the particles directly interact with the solar radiation, right? And then it creates this net cooling effect of the Earth's climate, okay? So there is also the indirect effect, which, the, which is the potential of these particles to form cloud droplets. Okay, so we mentioned that for all of these clouds, um, originally they come from very tiny particles. So water will condense onto the surface of particle to form these uh, clouds, right? So um, you may wonder, well, we didn't see that process directly. Is those are very small scale processes. How can we confirm that the clouds are formed in the, that way? So this is this image, um, I would say is a direct evidence of how the particles are forming clouds. So if you look more directly, you see a lot of these stripes, right? Stripes of clouds. So they're not formed by nature. Right? There's no way that a cloud will extend for this long of a distance. Actually, these are coming from the ship plumes. Okay, so when we look at the ship, the plumes coming from the ship, it's not uh, emitting white smoke. Normally, it emits black smoke. Right, so the black smoke will, will contain a lot of particles. And when the particles, let's say this is our ship, right? 
generate these particles. So after these particles are generated, they're being mixed higher up into our atmosphere, right? So some of them will get transported higher to the atmosphere. And we know that there are a lot of water vapor over the ocean, right? So they can form these tiny cloud droplets. And these long, really long uh, stripe of clouds, it's just ship passing by the ocean. They generate these tiny particles and form the clouds. So this is a direct evidence of how the um, particles can form clouds and further affect the Earth's radiation. Right? Um, so last year, we know that um, there's very strong uh, wildfire events over the Amazon forest because um, I mean, thousands of, or millions of acres of uh, forests are being burned, right? So this is another satellite image showing the Amazon forest. So because of dry, dry weather, it also promotes the wildfire, okay? So you can see direct smoke coming out, right? The smoke will look something like brownish color. But once they mix into other uh, regions, you can see a lot of clouds forming. So basically, um, this is showing both the direct effect. So the, uh, the solar radiation will get scattered by these particles, but also they can form these clouds to um, basically form this indirect effect onto our uh, global climate. Okay, so this talks about the direct and indirect effect of particles. Um, so. Uh, we have to mention about the health effect of particle too, right? So we know that for PM, uh, when we inhale them, they will get into our respiratory system. So here on the right-hand side, I'm showing the uh, basically a human being. And generally people will divide the respiratory system into three parts. So we have the external region. So we'll also call this as a head region. It will just include the nose, mouth, and the throat region, right? We also have the tracheal bronchial region, tracheal bronchial region. So we'll use TB to represent this region. So this region just represents the major tubes in our respiratory system. So finally, we have the alveolar region. So that's the final region or the endpoints of our respiratory system. Okay. So on the left hand side, uh, what it shows is the deposition fraction, right? So it shows different regions, right? The head region, the TB region, and the AL region for uh, basically the deposition fraction of particles in different regions. And it is showing uh, the fraction as, of, as a function of particle diameter. So let's say we're interested in one micrometer particle. So someone generated a lot of one micrometer particles surrounding us. Let's say we inhale them. So where are they being deposited? We can use this. Uh, graph here. Let's draw a vertical line, right? So we can see that basically around 12% of these one micrometer particle are deposited into our head region. So this is the dashed line, right? And then around, let's say, 8% of them are deposited into the TB region. And uh, around, let's say, 5% are deposited into the alveolar region. So what happens to the rest of the particles, right? So further, we have this solid line represents the, the entire, the total deposition in the, uh, in the respiratory system. So you see that this total deposition is around 13%, okay? So what happens to the remaining particles? Around 87%. They are just exhaled about, right? because they're not deposited into any part of the respiratory system. They're just exhaled by the human being. So you see that not all of these particles are depositing in our human respiratory system, right? So the, mo and the ones that are most effective are those that have a size of around uh, eight or nine micrometers or those of very small particles, uh, very small sizes, a few nanometers, okay? So this is related to the <clears throat> basically the deposition mechanisms of particles with different sizes. And we will talk about these mechanisms later on. They include impaction, interception, and diffusion. Okay, so there's going to be a size window of particles that will penetrate or deposit into our respiratory system. So this has a lot of applications to human health. For example, the COVID-19, okay? So we know that um, the COVID-19 can be transmitted by droplets larger droplets, 
right? So when we talk about larger droplets, they are basically particles larger than five microns, one, two, three, four, five, larger than five microns. So you see that five micron particles, those larger sizes can easily get deposited into our respiratory system, right? So that's why we recommend wearing masks because masks are very effective in blocking these larger particles. And generally they have higher mass, so they can get deposited onto the ground. They fall onto the ground also with a relatively shorter time. So we'll demonstrate how we can do this calculation later on, okay? So um, this can also have medical applications. For example, uh, we're trying to uh, uh, provide or trying to uh, invent or manufacture nasal spray. We know that people have allergies, so you use those nasal sprays. So um, the way that the nasal spray works is it generates particles, right? It will deposit into the respiratory system to alleviate the, aller the allergy. So let's say we have a, a control in terms of the size of those particles coming out of the nasal spray. So do we want it to be this in this size range or in the larger size range? We want it to be in the larger size range, right? There in this size range, we know that most of the particles will just get a free ride in our respiratory system. They're not depositing anywhere. And most of them are just exhaled out, right? So we want them to have a larger size so they have a higher deposition efficiency into our respiratory system, right? So we'll talk about the, this deposition window here. Uh, so finally, about these functional nanoparticles, I think we're also getting to the end. So um, actually these uh, PM have wide application into our daily lives. Uh, so they can be used as catalysis, uh, in catalysis. So finally, when we talk about the removal of the nitrogen oxides from coal-fired power plants, we'll show that we actually use these nanoparticles to remove those gas species. Uh, we can use them as solar panels right, in solar energy utilization, paint production. A lot of paint use nanoparticles because they have better light scattering properties. Uh, we can use them in sensors, uh, in rubber industry. Um, for example, a lot of these tires, they contain soot particles uh, or carbon black. They're in uh, nano size range or micro size range. Uh, they basically use these PM to enhance the mechanical property of the uh, rubber. Right, and uh, for the uh, sunscreen we introduced earlier. So next time when you use the sunscreen, look at the instruction. For example, here in this one it says uh, it has uh, these function and with nano zinc oxide. Okay, so next time try to look at it. Uh, we use a lot of these nanoparticles in our daily life. So people also use nanoparticles or PM to remove uh, contaminants in water. So water purification and so on. Okay, so there are also con some controversial applications. People use uh, the nano uh, fertilizers to boost up the productivity of the uh, plants. Um, so there are a lot of expectations for the uh, application of these PM, okay? Um, so I think that's all for the contents of this class. All right, so let me know if you have any questions. Uh, this is a kind of an introduction to the PM section. So later on we'll get more uh, get into more mathematical part in terms of the PM control methods, okay? Uh, all right, thank you.